So hello and welcome back yet again to another evening with James Harriet and all of his wise and wonderful creatures. Um, we're doing it a little bit different today, mainly because I just felt like doing something different, I guess. So I, I recorded myself drawing a silly little picture and hopefully you will enjoy watching it unfold. I think it turned out pretty okay. I was going to draw something realistic and then suddenly it ended up being cartoony, which seems to be my whole new shtick. I don't know. It is it is what it is, I guess. I hope everybody is doing good today. I actually had a really good day. I got some, some stuff done outside again. Um, taking advantage of the summer weather. I got a little bit of mowing done and a little bit more yard cleanup done. Disappointingly, my turnips were all tops. I, I saw that they were kind of wilting a little bit, so I figured it was probably time to go and attempt to harvest them. And when I went out to harvest them, I pulled them up and they were smaller than like the tiniest carrots I've ever gotten, but the tops were huge. So, I left them out as an offering for Lily the deer. I don't know if she's into turnip tops, but maybe she is. I don't know. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Anyway, we're going to do a chapter, possibly two. Only going to guarantee one, though, because James Harriet's chapters are a lot longer than Laura Ingalls Wilder's are. So, yeah. When we last left, James had had some sort of an operation don't know for what, and it sounds like Becky doesn't know for what either. It, it is slightly ironic that he, he can write so eloquently about poor... God, now I can't even remember the guy's actual name. It wasn't Sammy. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he could write so eloquently about the, the guy with the testicular difficulties, but he didn't want to say what his own surgery was for, so gotta wonder about that. Anyway, let's jump in to chapter 41 of All Things Wise and Wonderful by James Harriet. My experience in the RAF hospital made me think. As a veterinary surgeon, I had become used to being on the other end of the knife, and I preferred it that way. As I remembered, I was quite happy that morning a couple of years ago as I poised my knife over a swollen ear. Tristan, one elbow leaning wearily on the table, was holding an anesthetic mask over the nose of the sleeping dog when Siegfried came into the room. He glanced briefly at the patient. Ah, yes, the hematoma you were telling me about, James. Then he looked across the table at his brother. Good God, you're a lovely sight this morning. When did you get in last night? Tristan raised a pallid countenance. His eyes were bloodshot slits between his puffy lids. Oh, I don't know. Fairly late, I think. Fairly late. I got back from a farrowing at four o'clock and you hadn't arrived then. Where the hell were you anyway? I was at the licensed victuallers ball. Very good do up actually. <laughs> I'll bet Siegfried snorted. You don't miss a thing, do you? Darts team dinner, bell ringers outing, pigeon club dance, and now the licensed victuallers ball. If there's a good booze up going anywhere, you'll find it. When under fire, Tristan always retained his dignity, and he drew it around him now like a threadbare cloak. As a matter of fact, he said, many of the licensed victuallers are my friends. His brother flushed. I believe you. I should think that you are the best bloody customer they've ever had. Tristan made no reply, but began to make a careful check of the flow of oxygen into the ether bottle. And another thing, Siegfried said. I keep seeing you slinking around with about a dozen different women, and you, you're supposed to be studying for an exam. That is an exaggeration. 
Tristan gave him a pained look. I admit I enjoy a bit of female company now and then, just like you. Tristan believed in attack as the best form of defense, and it was a telling blow because there was a constant stream of attractive girls laying siege to Siegfried at Skedale House. But Siegfried was only temporarily halted. Don't mind me, he shouted. I've passed all my exams. I'm talking about you. Didn't I see you with that new barmaid from the Drovers the other night? You dodged rapidly into a shop doorway, but I am bloody sure it was you. Tristan cleared his throat. Quite possibly it was. I have recently become friendly with Lydia. She's a very nice girl. I'm not saying she isn't, said Siegfried. What I am saying is that I want to see you indoors, at night, with your books, instead of out boozing and chasing women. Is that clear? Quite. The younger man inclined his head gracefully and turned down the knob on the anesthetic machine. Siegfried regarded him balefully for a few minutes, breathing deep. These affairs always took it out of him. Then he turned quickly and left. Tristan's facade crumbled as soon as the door shut. Ugh, watch the anesthetic for a minute, Jim, he croaked. He went over to the basin in the corner, filled a measuring jar with cold water, and drank it in a gulp. Then he soaked some cotton wool under the tap and applied it to his head. I wish he hadn't come in just then. I'm in no mood for raised voices and angry words. He reached up to a large bottle of aspirin, swallowed a few, and washed them down with another huge draught. All right then, Jim, he murmured as he returned to the table and took over the mask again. Let's go. I bent once more over the sleeping dog. He was a Scotty called Hamish, and his mistress, Miss Westerman, had brought him in two days ago. She was a retired school teacher, and I always used to think that she must have had very little trouble in keeping her class in order. Her chilly, pale eyes, looking straight into mine, reminded me that she was just as tall as I was, and the square jaw between the muscular shoulders completed a redoubtable presence. Mr. Harriet, she barked. I want you to have a look at Hamish. I do hope that it's nothing serious, but his ear has become very swollen and painful. They don't get, um, cancer there, do they? For a moment, that steady gaze wavered. Oh, that's highly unlikely. I lifted the little animal's chin, and I looked at his left ear, which was drooping over the side of his face. His whole head, in fact, was askew as though dragged down by the pain. Carefully, I lifted his ear, and I touched the tense swelling with my finger. Hamish looked around at me and whimpered. Yes, I know, old chap. It's tender, isn't it? And then I turned to Miss Westerman, and I almost bumped into the close-cropped iron-gray head which was hovering over her dog. He has an oral hematoma, I said. Oh, what on earth is that? It's when the little blood vessels between the skin and the cartilage of the ear rupture, and the blood flows out and causes this acute distension. She patted his jet black shaggy coat. But what caused it? Canker, usually, I said. Has he been shaking his head much lately? Yes. Now that you mention it, he has, just as though he had gotten something into his ear and was trying to get rid of it. Well, I said, that's what bursts the blood vessels. I can see that he has a touch of canker, though it isn't common in this breed. She nodded. I see. And can you cure it? Only with an operation, I'm afraid. <sighs> oh, dear. She put her hand to her mouth. I'm not keen on that. Ah, there's nothing to worry about, I said. It's just a case of letting the blood out and stitching the layers of the ear back together. If we don't do it soon, he'll suffer a lot of pain and he'll finish up with a cauliflower ear, and we don't want that because he's a bonny little chap. I meant that. 
Hamish was a proud, strutting, trim little dog. The Scottish Terrier is an attractive creature, and I often lament that there are so few around in these modern days. After some hesitation, Miss Westerman agreed, and we fixed a date for two days from then. When she brought him in for the operation, she deposited Hamish in my arms, stroked his head again and again, and then looked from Tristan to me and back. You'll take care of him, won't you? she said. And her jaw jutted and her pale blue eyes stabbed. For a moment, I felt like a little boy caught in mischief, and I think that Tristan felt the same because he blew out his breath as she departed. Oh, my gum, Jim, that is a tough lady, he muttered. I wouldn't like to get on her bad side. I nodded. Yes. And she thinks the world of this dog, so let's make a good job of him. After Siegfried's departure, I lifted the ear, which was now a turgid cone, and I made an incision along the inner skin. As the pent-up blood gushed forth, I caught it in a little dish, and I squeezed several big clots through the wound. No wonder the poor guy was in pain, I said. He'll feel a lot better when he gets up. I filled the cavity between the skin and the cartilage with sulfamidine, then began to stitch the layers together using a row of buttons. You had to do something like this or the thing would fill up again within a few days. When I first began to operate on the oral hematoma, I used to pack the interior with gauze, then bandage the ear to the head. The owners back then used to make little granny hats to try to keep the bandages in place, but a frisky dog would usually have it off quite soon. The little button stitch was a far better idea, and it kept the layers in close contact, lessening the chance of distortion. By lunchtime, Hamish had come around from the anesthetic, and though still a bit dopey, he already seemed to be relieved that his bulging ear had been deflated. Miss Westerman had gone away for the day and wasn't due to pick him up until evening. The little dog, curled in his basket, waited quite philosophically. At tea time, Siegfried glanced across the table at his brother. I'm going to Broughton for a few hours, Tristan, he said. I want you to stay in the house and give Miss Westerman her dog when she arrives. I'm not sure exactly when she's due to come. He scooped out a spoonful of jam. You keep an eye on the patient and do some studying too. It's about time that you had a night at home. Tristan nodded. Right, right, I'll do that. I could tell he wasn't enthusiastic. When Siegfried had driven away, Tristan rubbed his chin and gazed reflectively through the French window into the darkening garden. Well, this is a bit awkward, Jim. Why? Well, Lydia has tonight off and I promised to go see her. He whistled a bit under his breath. It seems a pity to waste the opportunity just when things are building up between us so nicely. I've got a strong feeling that this girl fancies me. In fact, she's pretty much eating out of my hand. I looked at him in wonder. Oh my God, I thought you'd want a bit of peace and quiet in an early bedtime after last night. <laughs> Not me, he said. I'm raring to go again. And indeed, he looked fresh and fit, eyes sparkling, roses back in his cheeks. Look, Jim, he said, I don't suppose you could hang around with the dog? I shrugged. Sorry, Tris. I've got to go back to see that cow of Ted Blinn's right at the top of the dale. I'm going to be gone for at least two hours. For a few moments, he was silent. Then he raised a finger. I think I have the solution. It's quite simple. In fact, it's perfect. I'll bring Lydia here. What? Into the house? Yes. Into this very room. I can put Hamish in his basket by the fire, and Lydia and I can, operate, uh, can occupy the sofa. <laughs> Marvelous. What could be nicer on a cold winter's night? Cheap, too. But Tris, I said, 
What about Siegfried's lecture this morning? What if he comes home early and he catches the two of you here? Tristan lit up a woodbine and he blew out an expansive cloud. Not a chance. You worry about such silly little things, Jim. He's always out late when he goes to Broughton. There's no problem at all. Well, please yourself, I said, but I think you're asking for trouble. Anyway, shouldn't you be doing a bit of bacteriology? Your exams are coming up. He smiled angelically through the smoke. Oh, I'll have a quick re th read through it, all in good time. I could hardly argue with him. I always had to go over something about six or seven times before it sunk in, but with his brain, a quick read would no doubt suffice. So I went out on my call. I got back about eight o'clock, and as I opened the front door, my mind was far from Tristan. Ted Bin's cow wasn't responding to treatment, and I was beginning to wonder if I was on the right track. Whenever I was in doubt, I liked to look a subject up, and the books were on the shelves in the sitting room, so I hurried along the passage and threw open the door. For a minute, I stood there, bewildered, trying to reorient my thoughts. The sofa was drawn up close to the bright fire. The atmosphere was heavy with cigarette smoke and the scent of perfume, but there was no one to be seen. The most striking feature was the long curtain over the French window. It was wafting slowly downwards as though something had just hurtled through it at a great speed. I trotted over the carpet and I peered out into the dark garden. From somewhere in the gloom, I heard a scuffling noise and a thud, then a muffled cry. Then there was a pitter-patter, followed by a shrill yelping. I stood for some time, listening. Then, as my eyes grew accustomed to the dark, I walked down the long path under the high brick wall to the yard at the front. The yard door was open, as were the big double doors in the back lane, but there was no sign of life. Slowly, I retraced my steps to the warm oblong of light at the foot of the hall. I was about to close the French window when I heard a stealthy movement and a whisper. Is that you, Jim? Triss? Where the hell have you been? The young man tiptoed past me into the room and he looked around anxiously. So, it, it, it was you? Not Siegfried? Yes, I just came in. He flipped onto the sofa and he sunk his head into his hand. Damn, I was just laying here a few minutes ago with Lydia in my arms, at peace with the world and everything was wonderful. Then I heard the front door open. But you knew I was coming back. Yes, and I'd have given you a shout, but for some reason I thought, Oh, God help us, it's Siegfried. It sounded like his footsteps in the passage. Then what happened? I asked. He churned his hair with his fingers. Oh, I panicked, and I don't know. One minute I was whispering lovely things into Lydia's ear, and the next I grabbed her tossed her off the couch and out the French window. I uh, heard a thud, I said. Yes, that was Lydia falling into the rickery. And high-pitched cries? He sighed and his eyes closed. That was Lydia in the rose bushes. She doesn't quite know the geography of the place. Poor lass. Oh, God, Triss, I said. I am really sorry. I shouldn't have burst in on you like that. I was thinking of something else. He rose wearily and put a hand on my shoulder. Not your fault, Jim. Not your fault. You did warn me. He reached for his cigarettes. I don't know how I'm going to face that girl again, though. I just chucked her out into the lane and told her to beat it home with all speed. She must think I'm barmy. He gave a groan. I tried to be cheerful. Oh, you'll get her around again. You'll laugh about it. 
but he wasn't listening. His eyes were wide with horror and staring past me. Slowly, he raised a trembling finger, and he pointed at the fireplace. His mouth moved soundlessly for a few seconds before he spoke. Christ, Jim. It, it, it's gone. For a moment, I thought that shock had deranged him. Gone? I said, what's gone? The bloody dog! He was there when I ran out, right, right there. I looked down at the empty basket and a cold hand clutched at my heart. Oh no. He must have gotten out through the open window. Oh God, we're in trouble. We rushed into the garden and we searched in vain. We came back for torches, and we searched once more, prowling around the yard and the back lane, shouting the little dog's name with less and less hope. After ten minutes, we trailed back into the brightly lit room and just stared at each other. Tristan was the first to voice our thoughts. What are we supposed to tell Mrs. Westerham when she calls? I shook my head. My mind fled from the thought of informing that lady that we had lost her dog. Just at that moment, the front doorbell pealed in the passage and Tristan almost jumped out of his skin. Oh God, he said, that'll be her right now. Go, go see her, Jim. Tell her it was my fault. Anything, anything. I just don't want to face her. I squared my shoulders and marched over the long stretch of tiles and opened the door. It wasn't Miss Westerman. It was a well-built platinum blonde, and she glared at me. Where is Tristan? She rasped, in a voice that told me that we had more than one tough female to deal with tonight. Well, um, er, uh, he, uh, oh, I know he's in there. She brushed past me, and I noticed that she had a smear of soil on her cheek, and her hair was sadly disarranged. I followed her into the room where she stalked up to Tristan. Look at my bloody stockings, she burst out. They're ruined. Tristan peered nervously at her shapely legs. I I'm sorry, Lydia. I'll get you another pair. Honestly, my love, I will. You better, you bugger she said, and don't my love me. I've never been so insulted in my life. What did you think you were playing at? It, it was all just a misunderstanding. Let me explain. Tristan advanced on her with a brave attempt at a winning smile, but she backed off. Keep your distance, she said. I've had enough of you for one night. She swept out and Tristan leaned his head against the mantel. It's the end of a lovely friendship, Jim. Then he shook himself off. But we have to go find that dog. Come on. I set off in one direction and he went off in the other. It was a moonless night of impenetrable darkness and we were looking for a jet black dog. I think we both knew it was hopeless, but we had to try. In a little town like Darby, you are soon out on the country roads where there are no lights at all, and as I stumbled around peering vainly over the invisible fields, the utter pointlessness of this activity became more and more obvious. Occasionally, I came within Tristan's orbit, and I heard his despairing cries echoing over the landscape. Hamish! Hamish! Hamish. After half an hour, we met back at Skidale House. Tristan faced me, and I shook my head, and he seemed to shrink down into himself. His chest heaved as he fought for breath, obviously. He had been running while I had been walking, and I suppose that was natural enough. We were both in an awkward situation, but the final devastating blow was going to inevitably fall upon him. Well, we better get out on the road again, he gasped, and as he spoke, the doorbell rang. The color drained from his face, and he clutched at my arm. That must be Miss Westerman this time. God Almighty, she's coming in. Rapid footsteps sounded in the passage, and in the sitting room, the door opened. But it wasn't Mrs. Miss Westerman. 
It was Lydia again. She strode over to the sofa, reached underneath, and pulled out her handbag. She didn't say a word. She just shriveled Tristan with a glance and then left. Oh, God, what a night, he said, putting his hand to his forehead. I don't know if I can stand much more of this. Over the next hour, we made innumerable sorties, but we couldn't find Hamish, and no one seemed to have seen him. I came in to find Tristan collapsed in the armchair. His mouth hung open, and he showed every sign of exhaustion. I shook my head. He shook his. Then I heard the phone. I lifted the receiver and listened for a minute, and then turned. I've got to go out, Triss. Miss, Mr. Drew's old pony is colicking again. He reached out a hand from the depths of his chair. You're, you're not going to leave me, Jim. I'm sorry. I have to, but I won't be long. It's only about a mile away. But, but what if Miss Wester, Westerman comes? I shrugged. You'll just have to apologize. Hamish is bound to turn up, probably in the morning. You make it sound so easy. He ran a hand inside of his collar. And another thing. What about Siegfried? What if he shows up and asks about the dog? What am I supposed to tell him? Ah, don't worry about it, I said. Just say that you were too busy on the sofa with the drover's barmaid to bother about such things. I'm sure he'll understand. My attempt at a joke fell flat. Tristan fixed me with a cold eye and ignited a quivering woodbine. I think I've mentioned this to you before, Jim, but there's a nasty mean streak to you. Mr. Drew's pony had almost recovered by the time I got there, but I gave him a mild sedative injection before turning for home. On the way back, a thought struck me, and I took the road around the edge of town to the row of modern bungalows where Miss Westerman lived. I parked the car and I walked up to the path of number 10. And there was Hamish on the porch, curled up comfortably on the mat, looking at me with mild surprise as I stood over him. Oh, come on, old lad, I said. You have more sense than we do. Why didn't I think of this before? I set him on the passenger seat, and as I drove away, he hoisted his paws onto the dash and gazed out interestedly in the road unfolding in the headlights. He was truly a phlegmatic little hound. Outside of Skidale House, I tucked him under my arm and was about to turn the handle of the front door when I paused. Tristan had notched up a long succession of successful pranks against me fake phone calls, the ghost in my bedroom, many others, and in fact, as good friends as we were, he never neglected a chance to take the mickey out of me. In this situation, with the positions reversed, he would be merciless. Instead of walking straight in as I always did, I put my finger on the bell and leaned on it for a few seconds. For some time, there was neither sound or movement from inside, and I pictured the cowering figure mustering up his courage before marching to his doom. Then the light came on in the passage, and I peered expectantly through the glass as a nose appeared around the far corner, followed gingerly by an eye. By degrees, his full face inched into view, and when Tristan recognized my smiling face, he unleashed a cry of rage and bounded along the passage with an upraised fist. I truly think in his distraught state, he would have attacked me. But the sight of Hamish banished everything. He grabbed the little dog and began to pet him. Oh, good dog, good dog, nice dog, good doggy, he crooned as he trotted through to the sitting room. What a beautiful dog you are. He laid him lovingly in the basket, and Hamish, after a hey-ho, here we are again, look around, put his head along his side and promptly fell asleep. Tristan fell limply into the chair and gazed at me with glazed-over eyes. Well, we're saved, Jim. 
but I will never be the same after tonight. I've run bloody miles, and I almost lost my voice with all the shouting. I tell you, I'm pretty much knackered. I, too, was quite relieved, and the nearness of catastrophe was brought home to us when Miss Westerman arrived within ten minutes. Oh, my darling, she cried as Hamish leaped to her, mouth open, tail wagging furiously. I've been so worried about you all day. She looked tentatively at his ear with the row of button stitches. Oh, it does look so much better without that horrid swelling, and what a nice, neat job you've made. Thank you, Mr. Harriet. And you too, young man. Tristan, who had staggered to his feet, bowed, and I showed the lady out. Bring him back in six weeks to have the stitches out, I called as she left. Then I rushed back. Siegfried has just pulled up. You better look like you've been studying. Tristan rushed to the bookshelves, pulled down Geiger and Davis's bacteriology and a notebook, and dove into his chair. When Siegfried came in, Tristan was engrossed. Siegfried moved over to the fire and warmed his hands. He looked quite mellow. I was just speaking to Miss Westerman, he said. She's truly pleased. Well done, both of you. Thank you, I said. But Tristan was too busy to reply, scanning the pages anxiously and scribbling repeatedly in the notebook. Siegfried walked behind Tristan's chair and looked down at the open book. Ah, yes. Chlorodastium septique, he murmured, smiling. That is a good one to study. It keeps coming up on exams. He rested his hand briefly on his brother's shoulder. I am so glad to see you at work. You've been just raking about too much lately, and it's been getting you down. A night at the books would probably have just been the best thing of all for you. Right, James? he said to me from across the room. You tell him. A few more nights like this will put him perfect. Right, I said. Put him right where he should be, Siegfried said. Right. <laughs> Quite. And Siegfried headed off to bed. And that is where the chapter ends. So I thought that one was pretty good. Um, definitely only doing one today because that was, that was a decent clip there. It didn't have really anything to do with his surgery, other than the fact that he enjoyed being the surgeon far more than he enjoyed being the, the patient. Can't say that I blame him there. And it's funny, thinking about Hamish and everything actually reminded me that I've only interacted with uh, Scotties, Scottish Terriers, a couple times, and they were not anything like Hamish. In fact, the Scotty dog that I remember the most bit me, and I still have a scar. <laughs> I think I was like eight or nine years old, and I was riding my bike, and he was an unfixed male Scottish Terrier, and there was a female dog that was in heat that was across the road from him. And I was riding by on the sidewalk and he was out on a leash. And I don't know if it was just the movement or if it was the fact that there was a female dog in heat nearby. But he ran out and he nailed me on the ankle, knocked me off my bike. And I think that was the only interaction I've ever actually had with a Scottish Terrier. But... That is one of the breeds that I'm still always like, Nee! But uh, I'm sure they're lovely dogs. <laughs> Actually, most dogs are lovely dogs, but since I've been bitten a couple times, I don't interact with them nearly as well as I probably should. But yeah, that's about it for tonight. I hope you enjoyed this chapter. I thought it was a pretty good one. And hopefully I will see you back soon. I hope you enjoyed the finished drawing, which should be just about done here in a couple of seconds. So I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, I thought they were cute little lovebirds. 
And anyway, I will see you either tomorrow for a chapter or two of Farmer Boy, or I will see you the day after tomorrow for a, another chapter of All Things Wise and Wonderful by James Harriet. But no matter what, have a wonderful night. Oh yeah, don't forget, hit the thumbs up button if you didn't already. It always makes me smile, and I will see you all later. Have a great night.